Good afternoon, everybody. Uneducated Economist here. So I would like to thank Jason from the Intellectual People's Podcast. He had me on for an interview the other day, and it was a great conversation. I'm going to leave a link to in the description to that video. I would appreciate it if everybody goes and checks out the Intellectual People's Podcast. Give them a subscription, like the video, and comment. Let them know what you thought about the conversation that we had. Thank you again, Jason, from the Intellectual People's Podcast for having me on your show. Let's talk about this pandemic. A lot of people want to call it a pandemic. They have these conspiracy theories, ideas out there that it was set into motion by governments. And I try not to fall into conspiracy theories. It's very easy to let your mind wander and kind of just, you know, go off crazy on some of these ideas. I try to pull legitimate news sources or as legitimate as you can believe them or at least have some sort of credibility to them. And I try to use that information to come up with some of the ideas that I have. If you can use their information basically against them, then you know you got something going on that may be a little bit more accurate than say going to another YouTuber who takes a little tiny piece of information and just blows it way out of proportion. Now, I refer back to this speech many times. It's one of the, it's one of the most telling speeches that I think came from the Federal Reserve. This one's titled Monetary Policy Strategies for a Low Neutral Interest Rate World. And like I said, we've gone over this speech many times. But this was given in November 30th, 2018. And now I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs out of this out of this um, speech just to kind of give you some ideas that they had an idea of what to do in case this exact scenario came down. In fact, they were looking for something to occur so that they could create the situation or have the situation created in which that they could then begin to raise their interest rates. Now listen to this. Today, and I'm talking about the Federal Reserve and the Fed funds rate. Today, we face an altogether different set of problems stemming from very low neutral interest rates. That is, the short-term real interest rate consistent with an economy operating at its potential alongside low and stable inflation. Ironically, the problem we need to solve these days is the risk of inflation that is persistently too low rather than too high. So back in 2018, they weren't worried about inflation whatsoever. In fact, they were trying to figure out how to get some inflation. And right then they were telling that it was persistently too low, like they were not able to achieve that 2% target inflation that they were looking for. I'm going to leave a link down in the, in the description to this speech. You can go and read the whole thing and you can find out many times or you can see many times inside this speech that they were keep referring to inflation expectations, right? Because, because inflation expectation is a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more you believe inflation is going to come, the more you behave in a way that actually causes the inflation to happen. Okay, now I'm going to read these, um, these other parts here. Uh, today... Door. Today's low neutral interest rates reflect the culmination of trends extending back 25 years. A quarter century ago, a typical estimate of the neutral rate in the United States was 2 to 2.5%. Two now, the neutral rate, that's where the Fed funds level is neither restricting nor accommodating the economy. It's neutral. It's landing like right in there perfect. And they were saying back in the day, it was 2 to 2.5%. Two consistent with historical averages over the preceding half century. Since then, however, there has been a clear downward trend in neutral interest rates in the United States, other or in the United States and other advanced economies, with current estimates ranging from 0 to 1.5%. Now, you think about where the Fed funds level is now, we may be at neutral according to John Williams' speech here, we may be at neutral right now. Now, it continues on. This is where it gets really important to think about because this one paragraph is incredibly telling. Think about this for a second. Three main global trends appear to account for the bulk of the decline in the neutral rate over the past quarter century. Number one is a demographics. Populations are aging as people live longer and birth rates have fallen. The second is productivity growth, which has slowed around the world. Third, is the heightened demand for safe and liquid assets, which has led to a wider wedge between yields on safe government securities or central bank reserves and the yields on riskier assets, assets such as corporate bonds. Now think about this for a second. There was three global trends that were interfering with the idea of having a neutral rate that was above that one and a half percent, right? So 
Three main global trends appear to account for the bulk of the decline of the neutral interest or the neutral rates over the past quarter century. The number one demographics, populations are aging as people live longer and birth rates have fallen. Think about what the pandemic did to all the old people, all right? Number two, the second is the productivity growth, which has slowed around the world. Think about the overwhelming consumer demand that we know was not real. That had to do with panic buying and allocations and the bullwhip effect. So we know by the second one that the, or that the second one is taken care of as far as productivity growth, all right? So you got the old people taken care of, right? Because there's too many old people apparently to this, according to the uh, speech, and there wasn't enough productivity happening. Well, those two things got taken care of. Well, I don't know about necessarily taken care of, but had issues dealt with during the pandemic, right? A bunch of old people had died, passed away, and I'm not trying to say anything mean or anything like that. It's just the facts that happened, okay? And then the last one, the third is the heightened demand for safe and liquid assets, which has led to a wider wedge between yields of safe government securities and or central bank reserves and the yields on riskier assets such as corporate bonds. Well, I think about the during the pandemic, it was an unusual and exigent circumstance. With this unusual and exigent circumstance, they were able to set up special purpose vehicles. These special purpose vehicles would never have existed if it wasn't for the plan for the pandemic. Now I got, got me saying it. If it wasn't for the pandemic. With these unusual and exigent circumstances, the Fed, along with the Treasury, set up this entity that is separated away from them. Right? With this entity, they had filled it with hundreds of billions of dollars and called it the corporate debt lending facility, saying that they were gonna go and buy corporate debt, the exact thing that was too far of a wedge between that and the safe and liquid assets of the US treasuries. So the US treasuries had a yield here, corporate debt was way up here, and that wedge was too big, they wanted to bring it down to a closer position, right? And that's what he was saying, that, uh, let's see here, the third was the heightened demand for safe and liquid assets, which has led to a wider wedge between yields on safe government securities or central bank reserves and the yields on riskier assets such as corporate bonds. Well, with that special purpose vehicle, they were able to put out the credible threat that they were going to be buying these corporate debts. And every, like a lot of people fell for this. I mean, there was YouTubers all over the place screaming their heads off about how they were going to be picking the winners and losers when it came to these corporations. But the facts came out that the Fed really only bought a little bit of this corporate debt. They put out the credible threat. They had the hundreds of billions of dollars ready to go. And the markets tried to front run the Federal Reserve. And so they went out there and started buying up a mass amount of corporate debt and it drove the yields down on these things and it got closer and closer and closer to the U.S. Treasuries. They, sh they shrank that wedge that was creating a problem for them. The three main global trends appear to account for the bulk of the decline in the neutral rates. So all three of those problems wiped out during the pandemic. Very interesting to think about, don't you think? Now, everybody, everybody is concerned about inflation. There is not one person that I talk to who says that inflation isn't just tearing them up and that everything is going up in price and they can't handle the increase in, um, the increase in their standards of living. Now, something that I find very interesting is that a lot of people are not talking about the demand for dollars that is outside of the United States. There is a huge demand for them. Now, the way they judge the value of a dollar compared to the rest of the globe is something called the dollar index. And so they compare the dollar to a basket of other currencies that are that is out there. I want to show you this chart. OK, I don't know. Let me see if I can get it in there. This is the dollar index. We're at 108. There has only been a couple of times that the dollar was stronger than it is today. It was four years back in the early 80s from 1982 to 86 and again from 2000 to 2002. Other than that, 40 years, this chart goes back to 1980. And there's only been those two times that has ever been higher than it is right now. And if the dollar continues to strengthen, it's gonna be back to the 80s that we need to go in order to find when the dollar was stronger than it is today. This is creating hell across the planet, okay? What a lot of people don't quite know is that there is Countries like sovereign debt, corporate debt, that is due in dollars. It doesn't have anything to do with our nation. 
or our corporations. These are sovereign places like Sri Lanka. If you go and take, take a look at Sri Lanka right now, they are in complete chaos, economic downfall of all proportions. I mean, that place is like hell on earth right now. Some of the videos that I've seen are just quite dramatic. So Sri Lanka is a good example of what's to come with a lot of these other sovereign nations that are out there. Corporations like Evergrande are defaulting like crazy. So we're going to find that more corporations and more sovereign debt is going to go into default. And this is the corporate debt, sovereign debt crisis that I have been warning about for quite some time. And if this dollar continues to strengthen, we're going to start seeing more and more of that. What ends up happening is, is that these nations need to come up with ever increasing amounts of their own currency in order to get our dollars, the United States dollars, to get out of debt or to pay those bondholders. If they can't pay the bondholders, they go into default. And once you go into default, it's very difficult to borrow money. And then at that point, how do you function? So these are zombie corporations. These are zombie nations. And at some point, we're going to start seeing the zombie people start to rise once the recession really kicks in and if this dollar continues to strengthen, it's gonna get quite ugly. I'm gonna leave it at that. Let's have a conversation about this one. Uneducated economist, you guys let me know.